I want to also say Happy Lunar New Year for those that celebrate. And we want to also acknowledge the land that we're on. We are gathering on the occupied ancestral territory of the Duwamish. The Duwamish and all coastal Salish people have been stewarding this land for generations and generations, and so we give thanks and gratitude. We have a saying here at Valley and Mountain that all are welcome and that no matter where you are, whether you're up on that mountain top or down in that valley low or wherever in between, you are welcome to come just as you are. And we hope that you find a warm embrace and a, a feeling of home here at Valley and Mountain. For those of you who are new to our space, we want to just tell you a few things so you know how to kind of navigate the space. Um, we ask that you wear a mask um, in, our, in our service. Um, for those that are unable to wear a mask, that's okay. But if you can, please wear your mask over your nose and mouth. And we, we thank you for that. That's part of our radical hospitality here at Valley and Mountain. If you are in need of a bathroom, there is a bathroom, an ADA accessible bathroom, right out through the doors and to the right, and there's three more bathrooms down the stairs um, that you can also access if, if you have a need. We have three exits, um, two in the way that you came in, and then two more on either side of the stage as well. For families, if you're here with your kids, we have a kid zone in the back. Mick Summer, our youth minister, is back there to greet you and so you can hang out um, and, and be with your family and your kids um, here in the space as well. And then we're so grateful that Linda is here with us. Um, she was here, she was here this morning, and um, she has a way of challenging and energizing us in just the way we need. And so we're really blessed to have her here again tonight. Um, after her talk, we'll have some time for Q&A. And so if you have questions, um, it will be time to, to dialogue and to engage. And so there's some index cards on the stools here in the aisle way. And you can grab one of those. And, um, and, and we'll get your questions to her through, through the service tonight. There's a little song we sing that says no matter where you are on life's journey or where you're coming from, you can always call this place home no matter where you've been or what you've done. And in a world would have Muslims and Jews and Christians at each other's throat, we gather in this place in opposition and we say no matter where you are on life's journey or where you're coming from you can always this place home no matter where you've been or what you've done I wonder can you help me say no matter So why don't you look at somebody you don't know and tell them that, say, no matter, no matter where you are on life's journey, or where you're coming from, or where you're coming from, 
You can always call this place home. You can always call this place home. No matter where you've been, no matter where you've been or what you've done. No matter where you are. You're coming from or where you're coming from you can always call this place you home. can always call this place home no matter no matter no matter where you've been privilege to introduce uh, my friend uh, and my sister. I had the privilege of watching Linda's work from afar while living in New York City uh, when she was the director of the Arab American Association of New York at 25. It is not easy to fill the shoes of a distinguished mentor, and she did so well. Many of us came to know Linda through becoming uh, the co-director of the Women's Mart. But most of all, we may remember the level of hate and vitriol that she encountered for daring to speak on behalf of her people. To simply say being Palestinian means that they have the right to exist. And the level of hatred and vitriol that came at her and continues to do so. In fact, a few months ago, the New York Times reported that she had been the victim of right-wing attacks as well as Russian bots. Imagine the level of pressure coming at you, having to have your life and your family secured. This work is not for the faint-hearted. It is to say that one, and Linda has said, in the tradition of the world's most famous Palestinian, Jesus of Nazareth. That they would stand in solidarity with their people, but not only standing in solidarity with their people, but came to see about us in Ferguson. And would go on to found Muslims for Ferguson, being in the street when the conservative mosques were telling Muslims to stay indoors. She challenged her own community and says that if we are going to be in this place at this historical moment, we must be in solidarity with black people. That is courage. 
That is the kind of commitment that is rare among leaders. And then lastly, I want to say, she's from Brooklyn, America's favorite borough. And because of that, she has, in addition to being Palestinian, she has a toughness, a, a no-nonsense, a no-suffering of fools lightly because of the people who produced her and the borough that she was raised. And I want you to help me give a good old Seattle welcome to our dear sister, Linda Sarsour. Good afternoon. So I had the pleasure and honor of being here this morning at um, Valley and Mountain. And so I basically told them I'm going to give you the MLK version in the morning. And I'm going to do Malcolm X in the afternoon. I kept the spiritual in the morning, but now I'm going to give you my organizer self. Um, I just want to say, uh, first and foremost, thank you to Reverend Seku and the folks at Valley and Mountain for even having me here today. Sometimes our courage even shows up in the invitations that we extend to people. And to have someone like me stand here before all of you and in your church and to use your name um, to, to invite uh, me and others to come um, is something that I um, am sitting with full gratitude for. And I will not take this space and this platform uh, for granted. And I want to also tell folks who don't know that today is Reverend Seiko's birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to a man who has been gifted um, to us all. And I had the extreme tr pleasure of watching him on the streets of Ferguson as a man of faith, um, encouraging young people, um, holding them, um, in moments of trauma and pain that our country inflicted on them, not only, of course, during the times of the Ferguson uprising, but from generation to generation. And there was Reverend Seku showing them where God was, and God was in the street. God was with them um, outside. And so I have never forget, forgotten those images of Reverend Seku. And just want you to know, Seattle, you are very lucky to have Reverend Seku, because he could be anywhere else in the country, but he's here with all of you. This morning I was moved, um, you know, just kind of sitting here and reflecting um, on my own spiritual background and as a Muslim in a place like Valley and Mountain and, and this idea of just being able to show up somewhere and be whole in your whole self. And we live in a country where you can't do that all the time and some of us can't be that. You can't be your whole self in some spaces. And so these are sacred places. And I hope that you continue to support spaces like Valley and Mountain where Anyone of any background um, can come in here and, and bring their multiple identities uh, and, and be here. And as a Muslim, American, Palestinian woman, I can show up in my whole self. Um, I, as a Muslim woman, sometimes can't show up as my whole self in my own Muslim community. And, um, and so to be in spaces where I can be my whole self is something that really, um, you know, gives me hope uh, and, and, and allows me to, to reaffirm, um, again, who I am. And so I come here today unapologetically Muslim American and unapologetically Palestinian American, very Palestinian, as Palestinian as I can be. And I also come here unapologetically from Brooklyn, New York, right? I mean, God really gave me a whole lot of identities that are just a lot for one person. I mean, being Palestinian and from Brooklyn is a whole lot. And that's why, you know, I'm a, I'm a hard pill to swallow for some. Right now, as I think about where I am this afternoon, I am in perpetual outrage. Like, I wake up outraged. First, I wake up grateful that I even woke up, so I'm not going to lie about that. I do wake up and say, thank God I'm alive today. But once I get through that part of gratitude, I just wake up so outraged at, at the circumstances, at the things that are happening around us. And, and it just, my blood boils. And I, I tell a lot of people, people ask me, you know, oh, do you got kids? How old are your kids? And I say, my son's 23 years old. And they say, oh, wow, you look good for that. I tell them it's my blood. The, that boiling blood is good for the skin. It's, it's good. 
Um, and so I wake up perpetually outraged, and I want to kind of put us in some context today, and I want to say, first of all, Happy Lunar New Year, but also take a moment for um, those who lost their lives in a shooting that just happened last night in Monterey Park um, in greater Los Angeles, um, in a country that values guns more than they value the sanctity of life. I also want to hold um, the larger Los Angeles community when I think about Keenan Anderson. Keenan Anderson was a public school teacher who flagged down the LAPD after a car accident happened. Flag That's what you do, right? You get in a car accident, you see some cops, you flag the cops down, right? Because the cops are supposed to come help. And the cops came and saw a young black man who's obviously just got into a car accident. So you know how, how it is. You know, you just got into a situation. You're erratic, like you don't know what's going on. Immediately, the cops saw a young black man and saw a threat. Started questioning him. So he got nervous. Eventually, he probably had a thought in his head. I know how this ends. Got to get out of here. It's not based on his own mind. It's based on the countless times that we've seen young black men and women being killed at the hands of the people that are supposed to protect and serve them. We watched Philando Castile in a traffic stop be murdered in front of his girlfriend and her child. So I'm sure that's what he was thinking. So he wanted to get away. Cops got him, put him on the ground. Tased him one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. Last time they tased him, he was already handcuffed and he was already laying down on his belly. He wasn't a threat to nobody. Keenan Anderson is dead. He's dead at the hands of the LAPD. This is what the LA community is dealing with right now. This is what black people and marginalized people are dealing with in this country, in this United States of America that we live in. And I always say to people that not only am I outraged, I'm ashamed sometimes. Because we are the first generation, us in this room, that have to tell another generation that comes after us that they have less rights than our grandmothers had. That never happened in America, right? Even with the slow progress, every generation got a little something, right? Women got the right to vote then black men got the right to vote, and then black women got the right to vote, then there was an immigration act, and then the immigrants got natural, I like, there was always, then there was women's reproductive rights, and then little by little, there were like little things that happened that progress, even if it was small progress. Imagine us. We have to be the shame generation to say to another generation, you got less rights than I do, or less rights than our mothers did before us. That outrages me. So that's not why I'm on the streets every day. It's not why I organize. I want to be able to tell my daughters and granddaughters and great-granddaughters and great-grandsons and that, I, that you got more than I had. And that I fought for you to have more than what I have. And what we see in our country is a regression. For God's sakes, we can't even protect voting rights in, the, in, a, in a country that purports that we are a democracy. We go around the world telling everybody how they need to have a democracy and we can't even have a real democracy here in the United States of America. We go around criticizing Muslim nations and other nations, right? Dictatorships, those people are honest about who they are. They tell you we're monarchies, we're dictatorships, that's what we are. And we claim that other countries are, violate women's rights and violate communities' rights. We are fighting for women's rights in America, rolling back the rights of women and reproductive rights in America. So sometimes we got to say to ourselves in our own country, stop throwing stones from glass houses. This is a glass house that we're living in right now. 2022 was the deadliest year for police violence in America. Police killed more people in 2022 than they've ever killed before in any other year. And it's like we go on like that's just how it is, right? That's just what, that's just what it is. What are we going to do? Just let it happen. Migrants who are coming at the border and cross into Texas and then a governor thinks that he could put people in buses and ship them to New York and ship them to other states. These are human beings. These are people who sacrificed everything to bring their family to this country for some sanctuary. And we're treating them like they're some cattle. This is unacceptable. We watch a governor in Florida, DeSantis, who literally just banned African-American AP studies. 
because he says there's no educational value to teach about black people and the history of black people in America. Black history is American history. Black studies is American studies. Now, why do you think that a person like DeSantis doesn't want to teach us about black history? Because they say if you know your history, you hopefully won't repeat it. But if you don't know your history, you might do the same thing over and over again. And that's what people like DeSantis want to happen. So I sit and I watch these things happen around me, and I'm in perpetual outrage. Because I think about what happened when Donald Trump became president of the United States of America. And a lot of people were outraged. I'm not going to lie to you. I was outraged too. But I was outraged for a different reason. I was outraged at the outrage. Because I was looking around like, are you serious right now? Are you outraged that there is a man who is a sexist, misogynist, racist, xenophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, homophobic, ableist that's about to go to the White House? As if this one man who embodied all of these things suddenly introduced that to the American public. I said, where in the hell have you been? And so I'm not going to lie to you, I sat with a little bit of outrage in me at the people that were outraged. It said to me that the only time that you get outraged is when you feel directly impacted. That you don't care about your neighbor, you don't care about the kid that's in another district right down the street for you. You have to be personally impacted. You got to feel a little personally persecuted in order for you to fight for somebody that you do not know. And so when the opportunity for the Women's March came around, and let me tell you, a lot of people will sit here and say, you know, that was in one of the most inspiring days of my life, and it was for me as well. But let me tell you, it wasn't the most inspiring thing that I've ever organized. It was the, one of the most difficult places of my career in activism. I went to the Women's March because first, black women warned us. They said, hey, don't go, don't go on over there with the white ladies. <laughs> Done this before a few times, it doesn't work. We marched with them for voting rights, then they got voting rights, and we didn't get no voting rights, and they, a lot of things, you know, they don't, they don't got no solidarity. They want you to work for their rights, but they ain't gonna be there for you. And I said, you know, just, uh, you know I know my history, you, you're right. That's why I don't do that suffragist white, wearing all white stuff. Like, I don't like, I, that, I'm triggered every year by, by folks who celebrate the suffragist movement. Because if it wasn't every woman, then there's nothing to celebrate. So then they said, they said to me, one white woman who was with the white, other white woman said, this is not going to work. We got to go get us some women of color because this is not going to be okay. So they came on over here and they said, they found Tamika Mallory. And, you know, Tamika said, I come with a trio. It's me, a Mexican Chicana named Carmen Perez, and a really spicy Palestinian Muslim woman from Brooklyn. So you're either going to take us all or you take none of us. So they said, we'll take you all. Come on on over here. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. <laughs> so we went to the Women's March because we decided that, and even though we did take into consideration the warnings that we got from some of our elder black women that were our mentors in the movement, we said to ourselves, this Women's March is going to happen without us because them white ladies are going to go out there and do a Women's March. And it's probably going to have a lot of people out there because people were outraged. But if we weren't at the table, our people weren't going to be at the table, and our issues weren't going to be at the table. Because what we knew about white women at that time is that they cared about only some specific issues. They cared about women's reproductive rights. They cared about pay equity. They wanted women to get paid the same. And so when we went to the Women's March, we started having conversations. We said, let's make something very clear. We are not here to march against Donald Trump, because if that's what you're here for, that's not why we're here. We're here because we want to stand for something. We want to introduce the American people to an intersectional platform and a community so they can see the diversity of the pain and trauma of America and the people who are closest to the pain who are going to be closest to the solutions that we're looking for. So we started talking about criminal justice. And they said, what has criminal justice got to do with women's rights? What do you mean immigration? What does that got to do with women's rights? What about climate justice? We get it, the climate's important, but we don't see the intersection. And that's the exact problem of how we got to Donald Trump in the first place. Audre Lorde said, 
We cannot have single issue struggles because we do not live single issue lives. And so what we've done in the movements for so long is the climate justice people are sitting over here in this corner organizing. The immigrant rights people are over there. The health care people are over there. The racial justice and ending police brutality people are over here. And then you expect me to decide where I want to organize. If the climate justice people aren't talking about racial justice, you don't have a climate justice movement. That's just what it is. Environmental racism is based on race whether you like it or not. When we talk about health care and access to health care and the way in which we conduct health care in America, it has to be framed in a racial justice. The, the, the mortality rates ar around black women in health care, the way in which black women get access to health care, is something that you can't just talk about in general terms of women. It doesn't work like that. People are intersectional in their identities. They bring different identities to the table, which is how they are able to then figure out what their priorities are. So for example, if you went to the streets of Ferguson and you asked a black woman what her top priority issue, she probably wouldn't say reproductive rights. She'd probably say, I just want my black son to come home, with me, home to me safely every night. I want a better paying job. I want better transportation in Ferguson because that takes me an hour and a half to get to work when I could be home an hour earlier to take care of my children and be there to spend time with my children. I care about affordable housing. I can't even afford to live in my own city anymore. I had to move outside of Brooklyn. I'm born and raised bred Brooklyn. It's in my blood. And I held out for 41 years trying to buy a property to build some generational wealth in my hometown. And I couldn't do that because of gentrification. That's all over Seattle, I saw it. I went to Portland, Oregon. I went to Colorado. They showed me a city that was a black city. Black neighborhoods. And I didn't even see maybe three black people. That's what I sure did see some bike lanes out there. That's how you know that when you see the bike lanes, that's when you know gentrification is there. And I understand bike lanes are for safety, and I appreciate that, but it also comes with a lot of other things that we have to weigh. And so I'm calling us to a higher moral ground, and I want you to be outraged. And while today we're sitting in kind of a community, like a church community that has called us here to the space together, we got to invite rage into our houses of worship. Because there's this whole thing about peace and this and that, and I'm like, when you look at the sacrifices of prophets, when you look at what people endured historically, even the, in the times of religion and creations of religion, there was resistance to injustice. Jesus resisted injustice. He didn't just lay around and said, we're all gonna get along. He was like, I'm not with this status quo. Oh, those are the people that you wanna discard in society? Well, guess what, I'm gonna go over there with them. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him. He never wanted to be with the powerful people. He wanted to be with the widows and the orphans and the sick. That's, that's the people he wanted to break bread with and be with. And so even when we think about how faith has been structured in the United States and how it's been weaponized, that's why people are struggling. And they're saying, where's the church? Where are the people at the synagogues? Where are the young people at the mosque? They're not coming until you start using the platforms of the churches and the mosques and the synagogues and the temples to speak truth to power and to put them in this context today. Young people are looking for courage. Young people are looking for us to use faith as a way to drive us towards justice. And when they don't see that, when they don't see the people of the church on the front lines with the young black and brown people fighting for justice, when they don't see us at the border, when they don't see us fighting for their fundamental rights to be full and whole human beings, they don't want nothing to do with faith. So the crisis of faith is not from them, it's from us. It's from our religious institutions. There are young people in our community that are dying of opioid crisis because they're trying to numb the pain of everything that they see that is around them. They're confused about why we are in the circumstances that we are in. And so they go to things like opioids and other forms of drugs. And then, then they die in our community and we go to the funerals. And it happens again and again and again. 
And we're not asking ourselves, well, how could we bring them in? How could we embrace them? How could we bring them in a place to say, your life is worthy? We want you here with us. We are responsible for those young people in our communities. You know, I make a lot of people uncomfortable. And that's okay with me. Just want you all to know that. It's something that I sat with for a really long time, and I feel okay with that. You know why? Because every revered leader this country has ever had has been demonized, vilified, casted aside, canceled, whatever you call it these days. And I'm okay. Cancel me everywhere. But at least when I go to bed at night, I know I spoke truth to power. I know that I tried my best to alleviate some harm and suffering. I know that I preached my faith in a way that brings people together, that I use my faith to fight for the most marginalized people. And that's what makes me go to bed at night. Somebody asked me, how did you sleep last night? I slept wonderful. I sleep wonderful every night. Because I'm using whatever blessings I have to bless others. When people say to me I'm anti-American, they love that one. That's a good one. There's another one that they like to use, but I'm not going to reaffirm it here, but you already know. I'm Palestinian, just so do the math. But um, they love to say about our movement leaders that we are anti-American. And I say to people all the time, I challenge that notion. In fact, if there was a picture of patriot in the dictionary, it would have my face next to it. Because a true patriot loves their country enough to get up and say, I'm going to challenge you to be the best that you can be. Right. And I know this country has potential. If I didn't believe that this country could stand up to ideals, I'd be working God knows where, some nine to five job, and just doing, going home at five o'clock, watching some Netflix and eating some dinner in front of my television. That's what I would be doing. But I believe in this country. I believe in us, and I believe in our potential. And one of the reasons why people will call movement leaders and people like me anti-Americans because they don't want us to remind our people the history of this country. I have to wake up in remembrance that this country was founded on the extermination of indigenous people. It's not my opinion. It's not my personal analysis. This is a fact that we have to every day sit with us in this, in this country, that we stand and we live and we eat and we play and we work on stolen land. We live in a country that enslaved the African people. They decided that black people were not human. They were people, they, were, they could be taken on as property. That some of these structures that we see were built on the backs of black enslaved people. No, they weren't slaves, they were enslaved. Because I went to Africa and I went to Ghana, I just went to Ghana this year. Ghana is a, a nation of rich history. And their history isn't just enslavement. It's culture and civilization and inventions and brilliant people and scholars. And I got to experience also the horrors of enslavement, what we are capable of as human beings. And every day we got to work within our own selves to reject that type of inhumanity that was black African people were subjected to, that they are still subjected to in these United States of America today in different ways that are not called enslavement, by the way. Nothing, nothing is the past. They just reframe it and serve it to the American people in a different way. Sisters and brothers, it is outrageous that we live in a country that holds one quarter of the world's prison population. How is that possible? When India has a billion people, when China has a billion people, we are not the most highly populated nation in the world, but we hold a quarter of the world's prison population. And everybody's all right with that? That the private prison industry makes money off of incarcerated people? That's called slavery. It's modern day slavery. Guess what? 40 years from now, 50 years, some young people are going to get up and ask you when you were old great grandma, and say, where in the hell were you when they was over here doing some modern day slavery? Which, what was you doing? And we were just going to have to say we were alive. And we just knew it was happening. And we just, I don't know. It's still here. And the incarceration has quadrupled, if not quintupled, just in the last 30 years. And so we also live in a country that segregated people by race. And I will argue that we still do that. Go to Texas, you go over one interstate. 
One side is an affluent, mostly white community, and another side is poor black and brown people. We segregate people by class in this country. Our education system and the way funding works is based on the tax brackets of the districts in which those schools are. So we say, oh, there's no Jim Crow. We, we drink from the same water fountain. You go to the same movie theater that I go to. We go to the same mall and supermarket. Oh, but our schools are still some of the most segregated in the country, including in places like Brooklyn, New York, where I'm from. It's not OK. And it is outrageous. And in Seattle, and in Houston, and in Detroit, I mean, all over this country. If you want to see Jim Crow, go to the local public school system. Jim Crow is alive and well in 2023. We live in a country that interned Japanese Americans. Somebody decided that Japanese Americans were disloyal to the United States of America, that they were the enemies within, and we needed to protect ourselves from Japanese Americans. So what did we do? We went around, and we kidnapped them from their homes, and we put them on camps on US soil. So when you hear the anguish of Muslims, when we hear the same rhetoric that was used against Japanese against Muslims, Muslims are disloyal. We, can, we, we do not have the capacity to be both American and Muslim at the same time. There's some sort of contradiction between our faith and our citizenship, as right? That we are the enemies within, that we will put forth policies like unwarranted surveillance of mosques and Muslim Americans across the country. We will ban Muslim immigration to America. We will justify wars that kill one million people in places like Iraq. We will support perpetual wars like in places like Afghanistan. That is Islamophobia. That is what it is, folks. I don't care about the guy who don't like me because I'm Muslim. I don't care about who knows anything about Muslims and wants to be my friend. That's not, that's for me, y'all can deal with that. I'm talking about systemic, anti-Muslim sentiment that is translated into marginalizing and terrorizing people based on their faith. And that is exactly what has happened to Muslims in this country, at least in the last two and a half decades. Imagine that just a year and a half, two, maybe two years ago, somebody got up and said, oops. They didn't have weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Yikes. Well, that was a bad one. Damn. That's not a reflection on the people who lied. It's a reflection on the American public that was lied to. And overall was silent about it. So some white man that sounded smart got up and told you there was weapons of mass destruction and apparently we went along with that. And we used our taxpayer dollars to murder innocent Iraqis. And then all these years later now we're saying, yeah, actually that was wrong. With no reconciliation, with no compensation. We destroyed one of the origins of civilization, and everybody knows that. There's, Iraq was a stronghold of history and civilization for Muslims and Jews and people all over the world came from that region. And now it's in shambles. People lost their entire families, entire generational wealth, museums and artifacts and history at the hands of the United States government. And we just were like, sorry, oops. Actually, we didn't even say sorry to anybody. We just said that we probably shouldn't have done that. We went to Afghanistan, and only one brave black woman named Barbara Lee got up as one of 435 members of Congress, and she said, I vote against the war in Afghanistan. They, they, the backlash she received, how dare she oppose this war because we were going to go to Afghanistan and free the Afghani people from the terrorists, and we were going to liberate the women and do all the things, right? Guess what happened 20, almost 21 years after that war in Afghanistan that we apparently Withdraw from, withdrew from last year. The same people that we claimed we were going to save the Afghan people from are the leaders of Afghanistan right now, right? We went to beat the Taliban. Guess where the Taliban is? They're in the mansion. They're the leaders of Afghanistan right now. So 20 years killed innocent civilians, birth defects based on the type of weaponry and, and artillery that we used there in Afghanistan. And what did we end up doing? destroying the country more than it was 20 years ago under the very so-called enemy that you thought you were going there to defeat. In fact, we emboldened them because now they are in the leadership that they I'm outraged. Like, I could sit here for days and tell you about all the things that outrage me. 
in this moment. I think about the Palestinian people, and a lot of people will say to me, and they say this to me all the time, you are so obsessed with the state of Israel. First of all, I'm Palestinian. So you would think that I would be obsessed with liberating my own people. So let's just be clear about the obsession part. And why also the state of Israel? I have no problem criticizing any nation that violates the human rights of its people. I don't care if it's North Korea. I don't care if it's Saudi Arabia. I don't care where you show me a place where they are harming people or they are engaging in, in suffering of people and I will, you, you call me Iran, you name it, I'll talk about it. I'm consistent. I'm consistent. I'm not a hypocrite. I don't choose to fight against injustice when it's just convenient for me. I'm willing to be maligned by my own people to stand in solidarity with other people who are harmed. But you can't say the same about people who are unequivocally pro-Israel. They will immediately, they will stand with immigrants, they will stand with other communities, but when it comes to the Palestinian people, all of a sudden the solidarity stops there. Right now, Palestine is in a very dire situation. With one of the most right-wing fascist governments that the state of Israel has ever seen. And by the way, if you ask any Palestinian, they'll tell you it's always been bad. But imagine bad being the worst we've ever seen. And so I say to people, why am I, why do I want to fight for my people? Why, do, why am I a vocal voice for Palestine? Because it is my taxpayer dollars that are fueling this occupation. So while we close schools in Chicago, we close hospitals in New York, right? Where we say we don't have money for health care, right? We can't, I'm sorry, you can't have um, a, a transportation system. Where are we going to get that money from? But all of a sudden, we still have endless humanitarian aid to only certain people, whether that be the state of Israel, right, which has one of the largest budgets, by the way, of any nation that we give money to. And then all of a sudden, we have billions of dollars for the people of Ukraine. And I'm not even hating. As a Palestinian American, I'm in unequivocal solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Let's just get that clear. But I'm trying to understand how do you celebrate Ukrainians resisting occupation and oppression from Russia, but all of a sudden it stops at the Palestinian people. You're watching media outlets show you Ukrainians with AK-47s and Molotov cocktails and you're rooting them on resistance fighters. But when some brown people in Palestine tell you we are worthy too and we deserve liberation, they're terrorists. They're savages. They can't govern themselves. Did you ever think about that, what that's rooted in? Afghanistan, we would draw with Afghanistan some of the Afghani people, who, some of whom worked for the United States government, said, well, it's now you better protect us. So what we got to think about it, we might be able to take some of you. You saw people hanging from planes. We let in a couple of thousand Afghan refugees, some of them here. But when the thing happened in Ukraine, guess what? The door was wide open. Thousands of Ukrainians came into America for sanctity and safety. And guess what? They are welcomed here. But so should Afghan refugees be welcome here. So should Syrian refugees and Iraqi refugees and Somali refugees and Sudani refugees and anybody and, and Central Americans coming over our border. They are welcomed here too. So we got to think about what our country continues to do. And they're so overt with it. So when I say to people all the time that even if you don't care about the Palestinian people, the question you ask yourself, should your hard-earned money, when you go to work and you work hard, and they take a percentage of your money to occupy and harm another people, that's where the American people got to say, stop right there. I want my money in our public school districts. I want my money in a new hospital in my community. I want my money to house these homeless people in the streets that deserve dignity and deserve housing. There's one solution to homelessness, not a hundred solutions, one solution, housing. I don't need a debate about it. I don't need you to sit me down and do some analysis. Homeless people need housing. But you don't got the money for housing because you're put too busy sending your money abroad instead of spending it on the people in our nation that need those resources. And so yes, I'm outraged. And if calling out the injustices in this country is anti-American, call me what you want. Call me what you want. Knock yourself out. But I'm not going to stop speaking truth to power. 
Because this work in justice is not about pleasing people. And let me tell you, if you're working and you think you're an activist and organizer, and there are people who are not mad at you, you are not doing it right. You're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. Somebody got to be mad. I'm very grateful that a lot of people be mad at me. All kinds of people. I'm equal opportunity hate. I get it all the way from the left to the right and everybody in between, and I'm okay with that. Because that is what true a true organized, someone who truly centers the most marginalized people. And I always say to people all the time, they say to me, you know, a lot of people that are not Muslim will say this to me, they say, I can't believe you. You're not afraid, are you, huh? I said, well, as a Muslim, what I believe is when God wants me, God's going to take me. So nobody got control over me. So you could come in a space, you want to assassinate me, you want to do this to me, you do you. Because even if I do go out that way, that God decided the day that that was going to happen. And you know what? I would be proud to die a martyr in the cause of justice. So I want you to know I'm not afraid. And that's why I'm still outside. And uh, somebody else would have said, you know, I did what I got to do, right? I gave, I did my part. I've been here, for, I've been here more than half my life. But I know that I got a lot more to do. You know why? Because God chooses certain people. And I believe that I'm a chosen person. Because even my own children who have experienced deep trauma, imagine you as a child reading really horrible things about your mom on the internet. You know, someone who loves you, someone who feeds you, someone who clothes you, someone who studies with you, someone who tells you that they love you, someone who protects you. And, and when they go on the internet, their mom is a monster to the rest of the world. Or children who are not sheltered from the world of the internet and see threats, right? Watch the mail that came to the house. Watch the mail and the voicemails that went to their grandma's house. And amidst all of that, they grad two graduated college with honors. One just started college. My daughter just graduated high school in Brooklyn just this past June and was the salutatorian of her class. And I was telling somebody yesterday that while it's something that, of course, I'm very proud of, but just to give you a perspective about some of the children of activists, especially those who are on the front lines. My children were forced to be perfect. They had no room for mistakes because they believed that whatever they did was a reflection of their mother. And so my children knew, and I remember this one time that I overheard my eight-year-old daughter at that time telling her sister, who was 11 years old, Hey, when do you get your report card? So my older daughter tells her, I think we get it next week. So my daughter says, oh, me too. I'm supposed to get my, my report card next week. And my younger daughter tells her, your report card better be good. And so my older daughter, who, by the way, you know, there's, you got different kids. My youngest and my oldest, those, they're naturally smart. Them kids that don't got to study, that just show up and take the test and get 100. My middle child is a, a girl that struggled. She had to study. And she struggled to be perfect. So she had to work overtime. So my middle daughter goes, I really tried my best, and I think I'm going to have a really good report card. So my younger daughter is eight years old. She said, you better have a good report card. Because if, you're, if the people get the report card and put it in the newspaper, and your report card ain't good, they're going to say that our mom is a bad mom. So imagine that, that our children are trying to figure out how to be the children of frontline organizers. Because with all that their parents have to endure, they don't want to be a burden. They don't want to be part of impacting their parents in any other way because they know that their parents are already going through too much things. So that's why my children are perfect. But I also believe it's because God took care of them. God was like, you do you and you take care of my creation and, I'm, and I got you on these kids right here. And they're wonderful children, wholesome children, respectful children, understand their faith. But you know what else they had to do? Sometimes they had to hide who their mother was. That they had to calculate a space and decide whether it was safe enough to tell people that I was their mother. Because while someone like their mother should have been celebrated, in their eyes, they knew that invoking my name could provide a different type of reaction, right? Or, or stoke a different type of reaction to them. And so I told them, that's all right. I know that you're proud of me. I know that you're proud that I'm your mom. And it's okay that you don't tell everybody that I'm your mother. This is the kind of things that frontline organizers in our communities have to endure. And so I wouldn't be an organizer 
if I didn't tell you that there were things that we needed to do. We got to show up, you know? A lot of times, you know, we hear that there's some sort of uh, rally that's happening to defend an undocumented person who maybe is on the process of deportation. Sometimes we hear about a, a young black man that may maybe have been murdered by police somewhere in, you know, the larger county area. Sometimes we hear about, you know, a legislation that's about to come down that could be really harmful to our people. We start doing all these things like, oh, I just came from work, I'm really tired. And, and I'm not saying that we need to overexert ourselves, but sometimes we got to work through that just a little bit. And we got to understand the power of showing up as an individual, because sometimes we say, oh, nobody's going to notice that I'm not there. Like, I'm just one person. But that's how mass mobilization works. It's one plus one plus one plus you plus you. That's power. So your individual presence is monumental and necessary. So every time the back of your mind is telling you, that inner voice is telling you nobody's going to miss me there, I promise you we're going to miss you. And we want you out there. And if you could bring a friend, bring a friend. Because the only way that opposition is going to know not to harm our people and to back up as if we are outside and we are in visible solidarity with one another. So show up, work through it. Sometimes you've heard people in the movement say, some, say this chant that is by Asada Shakur, and it ends with, we must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And I always think to myself, how are we supposed to love and protect one another when we don't know one another? And I think about that in the in, in context of Japanese internment, right, which is pretty close. It's like 80 years ago in the United States, in this context of the United States. And I remember this young man at Cleveland State University who was an MSA student who got up one day after a lecture that I gave, and he was anguished. It was like 2016 election, and he was hearing all the stuff, and he got up and he asked me a question. He said, Sister Linda, who were those people that were living around the time of Japanese internment? were those people? And he didn't even wait for me to answer, because I'm not going to lie to you, he took my breath away. And he sat down. A Couple of days later, I'm in my office in Brooklyn, and his voice came to me again. Same question, it just was in the back of my ear. And I said to myself, I know exactly who those people were. They were the silent majority. They weren't bad people or evil people. They were people that probably looked through their kitchen blind and saw their Japanese American neighbors being taken away, but they didn't have the courage to go outside and say, not on my watch. You will not take my neighbor. Because I also believe that there wasn't a relationship. And so I want you to imagine with your neighbor that you, your children played with the neighbor's children. When their holiday came, you wished them a happy holiday, they wished you a happy holiday. You broke bread together. One day their child came from school and you were, and, 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 and their parents were, were late at work and the door was locked and you welcomed them into your home. You took care of their child while they were at work. You broke bread together. Your car broke down, they helped you with your car. You borrowed their car. There was a relationship there. And when you have a relationship, when you get to know people on a deep level, you better believe if I saw a cop come to your house, I'm going to be outside. I'm going to be like, you have to get through me before you get to Mercedes. But you can't do that if you don't know your neighbors. If you don't know the guy who works in the cubicle next to you. People work in companies. I've been to corporations where people would be like, yo, you're not even lying. I've been passing by this guy for three years and I don't even know his name. Sometimes you might even come to Valley and Mountain and see somebody and say hello, but you don't know their name. Where they live, where they came from, how they got to Valley and Mountain. This is the point of getting to know one another. Getting back to the pre-internet time. I'm grateful to be old enough to have grown up a pre-internet. I mean, there was internet in my time, but that was, you know, the dial-up where you, put your, you took your phone jack out and put it in the back of the computer, you know, those big computers. I still was around in that. That's my age. I wasn't the iPad generation. I wasn't the laptop generation. I still, I was outside on the stoop in Brooklyn. I knew every neighbor's name. And even till today, people think I'm crazy. I know all my neighbors, and I live in a, a street where we have a lot of Trump supporters on my street. You better believe I know who they are. <laughs> I say, excuse me, why didn't they take the garbage yesterday? Just so I could start a conversation. Because that's, that's the kind of country I want to live in, in a country where you and me are human beings, and we know each other's name, we know each other's stories. 
So I call on you to get to know one another. Don't leave here today without getting to know somebody that you didn't know before. When you go home, stand outside in front of your house and look up and down the street and say, who do I actually know around here? What if something really bad happened? Who would I go to for help in my street? And, and make a commitment and say, you know what, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to try to get to know two of my neighbors. That's all. Money. This is when people shut up. This is when the, 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 everybody shuts down. <laughs> Freedom is not free in this country. You either pay now or you're going to pay later. So I call on everybody in this room to think about a community-based organization in this community that you're going to make a commitment to, right? And a lot of people say, Sister Linda, you don't know my circumstances. I'm, it's, I'm struggling. It's inflation. The eggs cost $15. Like, it's a lot going on. <laughs> but I even challenge college students the same. You know, we all have some little things, you know, like self-care stuff. We like to get ourselves a nice little latte every once in a while. I had me a cardamom latte at Victrola Coffee, and it was amazing. Just wanted to, like, they didn't pay me to say that. It was wonderful. <laughs> and... I told college students, I saw you on the Starbucks line. You know, and I, and I, and I, and I don't want to take that away from people because sometimes that's the thing that we do to take care of ourselves. You know, so you got that nice little latte warms your heart a little bit. So I say to people, what if every Wednesday you say, you know what, this, this Wednesday I'm not going to buy myself a latte. I'm going to take that $5 that I'm going to pay to Starbucks or to a local coffee shop and I'm going to put it back in my pocket. And at the end of the month, I'm going to have $20. And I'm going to give it to a local organization that serves refugees. I'm going to give it to a local organization that works with marginalized young people. I'm going to give my $20 to Valley and Mountain for the wonderful work that they're doing in their immigration committee and other committees where they're doing social justice work. I'm going to give my $20 to the Council on American Islamic Relations that is defending the rights of immigrants and Muslim people in, in Seattle. I'm going to give my money to an organization that does reproductive rights. Or I don't even care what the issue is. If you care about any issue, just take those $20. And people will say, $20? What in the hell is my $20 going to do? Let me tell you, as someone who ran a grassroots organization in the streets of Brooklyn, $20 is a lot of money. And if you can find me 20 people to give me $20, that's $400 a month. You paying my light bill, you paying my supplies, you helping me get some supplies for a training, you help me get some banners together, print some flyers, whatever it is that I need, that $400 does a lot for me. And so don't ever underestimate the power of even a small donation that is consistent, that is with intention. The last thing that I'll say, and I always keep this for last because people, you know, squirm a little bit about this one, and I used to too, like 20 years ago. We have a flawed democracy in this country. I want to just put that out there. And I understand it's a flawed democracy, and it's one that disenfranchises voices like ours in our communities, especially with voter suppression and et cetera. But I still believe in the power of participating in democracy. And so I say to all of you, register to vote, go to vote, because even if we can't have an impact on the federal level, at least till now, we could have impact in our local politics, right? And what I believe about electoral politics is that it's harm reduction, right? You're not going to free the people. You're going to liberate the people through the ballot box, but you can alleviate some harm or maybe at least not cause more harm on our people. So when you go to the polls, even if you're not, you know, if you don't have no perfect candidate or people that you feel passionate about, it's also not about you, right? I want to engage in a solidarity type of politics, where when I go to the poll, I say, I don't know about all these people, but I'm going to the poll for marginalized people. I'm put, I put the images of people in my community who have been harmed and hurt and say, those are the people that I'm going to vote for even if I don't feel passionate about a candidate. And so do that. And so I will end with this quote, and I want to say that a lot of our Jewish American family who's here and many across the country that I have met, especially in New York, you know, you are one of the reasons why I'm, I am still here. Because of all that I have endured having allies and accomplices that have stood up and said, we are here in solidarity, that our, that our Judaism teaches us justice and equity for all people. And you embody this quote that I'm going to share with you. Reverend Seku embodies this quote. Valley and Mountain embodies this quote from an Aboriginal woman named Leela Watson. And Leela Watson said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. 
But if you have come here because you believe that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thank you so much to all the sponsoring organizations, to Valley and Mountain, for everyone who came out here tonight. I appreciate you all. You are amazing. Yeah. And I appreciate you. My sister Linda, and I say that seriously, my sister Linda, thank you for your words. More importantly, your call to action. I, I wanted to help, but now I know how I can help, so thank you so much. We're going, I'm imploring you to uh, write a question. We have cards and pens. We're gonna sing a couple of songs. Take this time and this opportunity to ask this wonderful woman some questions. Like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna um, have a Q&A, and Rev Sekou will facilitate that. But please, please, please write a, write a question on those cards. Um, on the stools right here, halfway through the auditorium. Yes, I see somebody walking. Okay. We're going to sing, oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me, over me, and before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave, and go home. Thank you all so very much. Uh, can we put our hands together again for our dear sister? Um, as folks are putting their uh, questions, and we won't get to them all because Palestinians, like black people, they long-winded. And so we're going to get to all of your questions. <laughs> we're going to get to some of them. Is that all right? But before that, I just want to have a chat with my sister. You know, one of the things that um, 
has always fascinated me is the way in which the left can eat itself. Particularly in the, like, there's particularly around, so not what the, we, we know what the right wing gonna do. They gonna be the right wing. How have you been able to negotiate the ways in which, when you've been attacked from the left? To be honest with you, I don't get really bothered by the right wing at all. Because like you said, you expect the right wing to right wing. But when I've been uh, attacked by the left or you know, people who proclaim to be progressives, that's where I'm just like, where, where do I belong? And maybe I don't belong anywhere. Maybe I'm not left or right or center or none of that. Maybe that's the problem, that we are putting ourselves into these, quote, different kind of labels. For me, the reason why I butt heads with a lot of people in the left is because there's a lot of elitism and intellectualism in the left that has not allowed us to multiply the, the people that I know are aligned with our values and principles. We use big words, we ignore certain communities, we, are, we don't have accessible lexicon and, and language, right, that reaches folks who English is their second language. People who may not have a master's degree didn't study, you know, Africana studies or study, you know, movements or study whatever, you know, Marxism and, 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 and communism and movements all over the world. We have this, this idea that everybody got to already be where we're at. And what I remind the left all the time is that we got to meet people where they're at, right? If you want me on your journey with you, you got to come get me from where I am. Because if you're already down the street and I'm all the way on the other corner, how am I supposed to get to you? You got to come back, walk back to the corner, and take me with you on your journey. And that's what I want to do. And that's what I'm willing to do. And so I don't want, I have grace for people. The left doesn't have grace for activists. Everybody got to be self-righteous and perfect in order for us to accept them as leaders. I'm not a perfect leader and I don't want to be a perfect leader. I want to be flawed because I want people to know that they can aspire to be an activist and an organizer and understand that they can make mistakes too. That they could be called in, that they could be loved, that they could be educated, right? And oftentimes what we see in the left is literally eating, us, eating ourselves alive, eating our friends and our sisters and brothers and people alive because maybe they said something that maybe, did, maybe made you feel a little uncomfortable. They might have even said something that was offensive. But what we don't do is understand people's intention. There's a difference between you being an offended and understanding the intention of the person that you were offended by. Because sometimes they didn't intend to offend you, but they still need to be called in and educated so that do, they do not repeat that offense or harm or hurt somebody else. And so what I've done, I've had to have courageous conversations. And I'm willing to do that. And we don't do that usually. Once you cancel somebody, you cancel them. I'm uncancelable. Because I'm going to be with you, whether you like it or not. And you're going to work with me. And you're going to come to terms. And we're going to work through it together. But a lot of times, people, when they have these tense moments of the movie, they just walk away from each other. I can't afford to walk away from you. For my people, I can't, I can't afford that. I got to be here, and I'm going to struggle with you. While you struggle with me. And I think if that's the philosophy and the theory of change, that we are all flawed people that are, just want our people to live better together, and understanding that we're flawed and we make mistakes and that we're just human beings, we're gonna be in a better place. Well, like, given, not that you lived in obscurity, but among, you know, so, so folks in the movement knew you, right? Folks in Brooklyn knew you, mm -hmm. New York City activists and organizers knew you, so one day, you're in front of the largest single day protest in US history and is one of the leaders. You described you know, very personally and vulnerably the ways in which it has impacted your children. But was there, was there a moment that you were like, oh, I'm gonna have to contend with what it means to be a celebrity activist, which is a different beast of its own kind. So how did you, like, was there a moment you was like, oh, this is, you know, I'm not in Brooklyn anymore, so to speak? Mm -hmm. I decry celebrity activism. It bothers me on a very deep, deep level. And what I want people to know about me, I didn't ask to be here, right? Nobody grows up, I, think, I wasn't a kid in Brooklyn, like, when I grow up, I want to be a, you know, a targeted activist. That's my dream. 
Like that's not what, that's not it. My dream was I watched a film called a movie called Dangerous Minds. That's how old I am. It was a it was a movie that starred Michelle Pfeiffer. And it was like she was this high school teacher, that English teacher that went to this like inner city school. And she was like, you know, telling these young people of color, like, you're amazing and teaching them poetry and literature. And it was just so inspiring. And I said, you know what I'm going to be when I grow up? A high school English teacher. That was my dream. That was my big dream to be a high school English teacher. When I was a college student, the horrific attacks of 9-11 happened. My people were under attack in my own community. My neighbors, those are my people. I see them. I saw the raids happen with my very two eyes. I watched every level of law enforcement descend on my South Brooklyn community. I remember watching men being lined up, coming out of an apartment building, told to lay down flat while their children watched from the windows. That's what I saw. I witnessed that. I said, this is not okay. And then, thank God, my parents taught me to speak read and write Arabic fluently. So all of a sudden I had a skill that my people needed. So I started translating for women who were looking for their husbands and brothers and sons who were kidnapped by the United States government. So I used the skill. I wasn't, I wasn't an activist, I wasn't an organizer, but somehow I, was, I happened to be there. And so I was, as I was helping these people in my community, as I was contending with the secondary trauma that I was experiencing, Months, weeks passed, and then months passed, and then I said, this is probably where I'm supposed to be. So I guess I'm not going to be a high school English teacher anymore. And then the work continued, and the trauma and the terrorization of Muslims in America continued, right? And then the war in Iraq happened, and the Department of Homeland Security was created. Then they did the call-in registration program where they called on Muslim men to come register with the United States government. I watched men on the third floor of 26 Federal Plaza, go up there and show their documents. And at some point I was watching them, some men went home and some men were like, you got to go through this door. So I went up to a security office. I said, where are these guys going? They said, oh, the FBI is on the 10th floor. So I took out a notepad and I, every time I saw a guy that was about to go that way, I called them over. I said, let me get your name and let me get a number of somebody that I could call. Because I want to be able to say that I saw you that I was the last person to, see, to know your whereabouts. So my point is, is that I ended up staying in the work. And then I decided one day, this can't be just happening to my people. I know there got to be some other stuff going on around here. So that's how I ended up in an intersectional movement before people were doing intersectionality. I, have, I became part of the movement to end stop and frisk in New York City. Because if you're going to religiously profile Muslims, then you're racially profiling black and brown people. That's all one policy. Let's work together. My people that are in my community were immigrants. So they should be in the immigrant rights movement because all of the policies, even the creation of ICE. So when you're fighting against ICE and ICE agencies, though ICE was only created in 2003 to get the terrorists, but they didn't find any terrorists. So they had to justify their bloated budget. So they started terrorizing people at the border and immigrants in our communities. And so then I became a member of the immigrant rights movement. So the point is I was also from Brooklyn. And I was also Muslim, and I had a hijab. So obviously, I was visible and memorable when people saw me. They didn't forget me. And they also didn't forget that I had some things to say, and that I wasn't afraid. And I would say things. I don't care if you're the mayor, the president. I didn't care who you were. Power didn't scare me. And so my point is, when we talk about celebrity activism, I got to a place of visibility, right, in a very dangerous way. And so when we see celebrity activists, there are some that are cute online and they write them nice little posts, nice little tweets, and they got these big profiles online and that's cool for them. I'm outside. And so the, the, the platform that I built for myself and I defend my status as someone who's visible in the movement, I worked for my, for my position. I was outside on the front lines and I'm still on the front lines and that's how people know me. People know me because they'll say, I, rem I met you at a conference. Yep. I met you at the border. I met you in front of 26 Federal Plaza. Oh, I saw you when you came to live with us in Louisville. I lived in Louisville, Kentucky for five months working on that Breonna Taylor case. I didn't know Breonna Taylor, but I was compelled that a black woman was murdered in the United States of America by a police officer during a pandemic and nobody knew Breonna Taylor's name. And I said over my dead body that a black woman's life is going to go in vain like that. So I packed my bags in a global pandemic, left my elderly parents and my children and my spouse, and I went all the way to Louisville, and I lived in Louisville amongst the people of Louisville to fight for Breonna Taylor. So, 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 so we have to also distinguish 
between people who have built profiles on the backs of frontliners versus the frontliners that have built those platforms. And there's a big difference between those two people. What has been um, the place that has given you the most joy in the work? Mm. Let me tell you folks, if you don't organize with black people, you're missing out on joy. <laughs> you know, sometimes like, I used to go to organizing spaces, specifically ones that are led by black women, and I would literally go home at night and think to myself, how in the hell do these people find joy? With all that they endure, they have taught me a type of radical love that I had never experienced before. Like, I, they create spaces where you feel like entire whole people, right? The way that they look at you when you walk in a room, right? The way that they move, the way that they strategize, right? The principles that they unite us around in a space. I watched them laugh and dance and chant. I just feel joy. And it is why when I went to the women's march, I had culture shock, just so you all know, because I never organized with white people before. <laughs> Other than some wonderful white progressive Jews that had always been in solidarity with Muslim people in New York City and protected us during very difficult times post 9-11, I never organized with white people. I came from the immigrant rights movement, which is predominantly immigrants, of course, and immigrant-led in New York. And I came from a racial justice movement, which predominantly was black people in New York and other people of color. And so the places of joy and why I keep coming back to the movement and come back to spaces curated by black women and why I follow their leadership is because it's not just about pain and trauma. It's about also valuing ourselves and also having radical joy and radical love. And, then, and, and for them teaching us what it is like. And it's similar when you go to Palestine, you said this to me earlier, that even when Reverend Seiki went to Palestine, the people under a military occupation, people who don't know if they're gonna live to see tomorrow, they still, they know how to party in Palestine. They still get married, they still have street festivals, they have night parties, day parties, all the time party. Because pe the most, thing that gives me hope is the people who are the most marginalized, the most oppressed, can still find joy and light through all of that, that gives me hope in this world. Thank you. I think we're going to start getting ready for some questions. When, I, when we were in Palestine, I think, is uh, Dr. Rothschild here? Dr. Rothschild and I actually went to Palestine together and has been doing amazing work with uh, healthcare in Palestine for a long time. And Come to find out we're neighbors here in Seattle, so it's good to see them. And so when I was in, um, we were in Palestine and we went into the African Quarter. And uh, um, first, the Israeli uh, army wasn't going to let us in. So they walked in and they stopped. And I remember my body having the same experience of being stopped by the police in the state. So I remember just kind of freezing and then I had a Rabbi Joseph Berman. Mm. Uh, you know, he talking shit to the <laughs> to the Israelis. I'm like, hey man, I, I know this is your land. <laughs> but I don't need him to pull out your pistol. Look to pull out his pistol. So we get through the African quarter and we're in the African quarter. And there's a uh they said we're having a festival. Just meet us uh at the gate and come so I, I left the delegation and I came back and there were some little kids waiting on me and they would come come so they take me up back and around through and I wind up in this space where it's this huge kind of feel and like thou, at least a thousand Afro-Palestinians right and they were having a festival and they were dancing and singing we had been tear gassed that morning mm -hmm. And they were singing, and it was at uh, um, the level of uh, just kind of cultural practice as a weapon in the face of all of that. The last thing uh, I'll ask before we get into our cue, uh, uh, our questions is where, not only like what are the ways in which you sustain Joe, where are the sectors in the movement that give you hope? I will definitely say that our racial justice movement still give me hope. As much as, just remember that even when we see the failures of some elements of our movement, remember the strength of the opposition, right? The strength of the Cointel Pro, maybe 3.0, I don't know, we might be at 4.0 by now. And understand- Did you just say what Cointel Pro is? Yeah, so basically, I mean, we watched this happen to 
civil rights movement leaders and organizations before, basically the infiltration and targeting by law enforcement agencies, sometimes sending agent provocateurs within our own movements to divide us against one another, right? Um, you know, the, the surveillance um, and, and, and scrutiny that our movements are under when it comes um, from, you know, aspects of law enforcement. And sometimes the point of COINTELPRO is to destroy our movements at their core. And so we have to be really conscious of when we see things that are happening. Sometimes it's not because the activists don't know what they're doing. There are outside forces that are doing everything they can to undermine those who are on the front lines fighting for justice and equity and anything that will take power away from the most powerful in this country. Um, so I still believe in our racial justice movements. We've seen uh, cities across America defund police departments and reallocate funding to mental health services and other services that are necessary in our communities. We have seen the election of young progressives and you know democratic socialists and young black people and young uh, other marginalized people who are really putting their voices forward in local community that came from the streets and the halls of power. Um, you know, watching, you know, the defeat of legislations across the country, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ, anti-women legislation in some parts of the country. You know, just watching the, 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 the intersectionality, going into a space, uh, you know, all these years later and seeing black women and undocumented people and white progressives and others all in a space together organizing when back in the days you used to walk into a space that was almost homogenous in some sense. So I'm starting, I still feel hope um, in the ways in which we're starting to realize that we cannot organize single issue, and we can't also organize um, without organizing with one another, bringing each other to the table. Um, you know, people still give me hope, you know? Um, conversations and just being um, in spaces like these and knowing that there are spaces like uh, Valley and Mountain and places like Middle Collegiate Church and Kadima and, and, and MAPS and, and, and CARE and other organizations that are bringing these conversations together in a way that's courageous but also centers the most marginalized people. We'll take some. Uh, we'll take a couple questions. Hello, oh, thank you. You, you. I'm going to group them so that you can have blanket ones. You, you answered the first one. How did you become an organizer? The other two related are: How did you cultivate your resilience and longevity as an organizer? And the second one is: How did you? How do you use your rage to animate you rather than be consumed or burned out by your rage? Mm, I love that. Um, the first question was what again? Remind me. Sorry. Oh. I, got, I got too consumed by the rage when I yeah. like rage. <laughs> How do you cultivate your resist, re, sorry, re, resilience and longevity as an organizer? Um, this, this answer is not for everybody, but I'm just going to share my own personal, right? Because different people find resilience in different ways. I'm a person of faith, um, and my faith gives me resilience. And so... Um, you know, the, the reason why I could do the work that I do is that, that I feel like I have a higher purpose. Um, and sometimes when we are connected to a higher purpose, it gives you that fuel, that resilience that you need to kind of keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that um, I believe that, you know, I am not here, like, and I wrote a book that's actually called this, that, you know, we are not here to be bystanders. Like, you are not here to walk over homeless people. You are not here to, to sit here in justice and turn a blind eye. That's not why you're here on this earth, right? And I think we're all being tested to see what is it that we, we are willing to share with others. So again, my faith practice really gives me that type of resilience. And knowing that when God wants me, God's going to take me. That's really the bottom line. When I was born, God already wrote down the day I'm going to die. And so whatever way that is, whether I get hit by a car, God forbid, or whether I get assassinated, I'm going on that day. And I don't want anybody to mourn with me. Remember that Linda told us that was the day that she was going. Um, you know, uh, the reason why I keep using this idea of rage is that rage has been criminalized in this country, right? And the idea of anger has been used to criticize activists and organizers and leaders historically, like when they call the angry black woman. Don't ask people why they're enraged or angry. Ask yourselves why you're not enraged and angry, right? right? And so I like to use this idea of rage, and people get challenged. In the Muslim community, they don't like when I use rage. I've been... I've had many scholars write posts about me on Facebook without using my name. Wow. And they use this idea that, that, that my approach to the world, right, in this idea of rage, and I say to people, rage is an emotion that moves you. Rage makes you uncomfortable, right? Because when you are in peace, if you're, if, you're, if you're asleep at night and you're comfortable, you're not moving, right? But when you are uncomfortable, you start moving on, you know, you're trying to find the right spot. So rage moves me. 
and, and, and the things that I told people to do. Rage moves me to, sh to go online and, and, and share stories or, or, or defend communities. Rage makes me go to the polls. When I'm enraged, I go to the poll and I, my, my, my lever is pulled because I'm outraged about something. So I want people to embrace this idea of being angry, that it's natural for you to be angry at injustice. Mm -hmm. So if you're not enraged and angry at injustice, then what are you? I can't be happy with it, can't be comfortable with it. You might be a little sad about it, but the real emotion that moves people is anger. And so I hope that people are able to channel rage in ways that are productive and that still and always send to the most marginalized people. Because when you send to the most marginalized people, then your anger will not cause you to do more harm to people, which then allows us to be enraged in a way that is nonviolent. And so rage for me is a, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling that I can't control. Like when I wake up in the morning, I'm outraged. But then I use that outrage to then say to myself, what am I going to do today to alleviate some suffering, alleviate some harm, share some skill that I have to at least make something even just a little bit better? And so, so don't be afraid to be outraged and bring your rage into spaces if that means that you're going to use your rage to alleviate harm and suffering. Thank you. Um, two more related questions, but I'm gonna let you choose. Um, how can black Palestinian Muslim communities um, build a strong coalition um, or act on the Palestinian cause is the first one. And the second one is, please talk about working in solidarity and dealing with disagreement. I love both of, both of those questions. First of all, the Palestinian people, the Muslim people, you know, some, as you know, some Palestinians of course are Christians, right? So we wanna make sure that not all Palestinians are Muslim, so it's clear here. But within the Muslim community, we gotta do our own work first, right? In every community, we have pervasive anti-black racism, and we just gotta call in our own people sometimes and have those deep conversations. And I wanna be clear when a lot of people say we also gotta build coalitions and relationships. Remember, we have one third of American Muslims are black people, right? So they are black people that are Muslims. So we, first and foremost, we protect and we love and defend our own black Muslim community as we build relationships with other black people who are not Muslim. So that's how solidarity starts. Solidarity starts within your family first. And then that will then be extended to the larger world that is around us. It's what I said earlier, you gotta you got get to know one another, right? And I say this a lot to my Muslim community. In New York City, we have segregation even in the Muslim community. We got the black mosque, we got the African mosque, we got the Arab mosque, we got the South Asian mosque, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Bangladeshis have their own mosque. I used to go all the way to Bedford so I could pray at Meshit Thakwa, which is a black mosque. That's an intention that you make. Those are my people, they pray the same way that I pray. They pray from the same book that I pray. So why do I gotta only pray at my mosque where all the Palestinians go? So I'm gonna go over there and pray with them. And it's the house of God, ain't nobody gonna tell me not to come into the mosque. I'm actually quite welcomed in any mosque. And you would be welcomed in any mosque across the country. And so make that intention if you go to a church or you go to an event and you see that there's a programming happening at a predominantly black church and they're doing a program, whether whatever, about something that you are interested, show up. Get to know some people in your community, right? That may not be people that you're always around. So solidarity is gonna always start with us getting to know one another. And once we know one another, know each other's stories, then that solidarity is natural. I have never sat down and told my story as a daughter and granddaughter of Palestinian and told people my struggle and somebody looked at me and said, nah, chill, I ain't with that. That's good for your people that they're, you know, that's just not a thing. But you're not gonna be in solidarity with me if you don't know me or if you don't know Palestinians and you don't know just like I'm gonna be in solidarity with you knowing your, your story. Um, the second um, question I thought was a really good one. What was it, Mercedes, the next one? Oh, about disagreements. Yes. The first, uh, you know, I am trained in Kingian and nonviolence. Um, so that's the, the kind of ideology that I'm rooted in in my organizing. Because sometimes this world could make you wanna be very violent. And it requires real principled, right? Like, you really gotta be disciplined in a country like this that purports so much violence on our communities and bodies for you to choose to be disciplined in nonviolence. So it's not something that's natural. You gotta be, you gotta, you gotta learn to be nonviolent. And I say that because one of the principles of nonviolence, of, of Kingian nonviolence is, um, there's a few principles, but one of them is uh, attack the forces of evil and not the people doing evil, right? That's why I was outraged by this outrage about Donald Trump. 
Because it's not about Marjorie Taylor Greene or about that one council member that you don't like or about that one pastor or the one rabbi or the one imam. That's not, that's not the point. The point is we got to be focused on the systems and the, and the social ills before you're focused on the individuals that you don't agree with. Because that's they not the problem. Because when they die, another generation rises up. The other, the other um, uh, principle of nonviolence is gather information, right? And that's the problem in this country. Nobody wants to do the work. So being able to gather information before we make assumptions about other people. And be willing to have the conversation. And I know some people, and I, and I appreciate when people say this, some people say, I don't have the emotional labor, right, to explain to certain groups of people why this and, and, and defend my humanity and all that. And I, I appreciate that. But some people want to do that work. I'm one of those people. And I think we could work through disagreements. And I think Son of Baldwin, who many people follow on social media, one time said something, and I'm paraphrasing. Um, we could still love, and, love one another and be in disagreement. As long as, as long as you agree that I at least have the right to exist. And if you at least believe that, then you and I can have a conversation. But if you don't believe that I as a Muslim or as a Palestinian deserve the right to exist, then you and I can't have a conversation. So I, I, I think we are in a moment right now of depolarization that I, I want people to take risks to have those courageous conversations. And I, I shared this quick, really quick story about explaining to a, a, a couple, a man and a wife in Ohio, about how our school system is set up. They're Republicans. They had a Trump sign in front of their house. And I explained to them that how schools were funded based on the tax brackets of the district. Guess what these Republican white people told me? They said, that's outrageous. They didn't know that. And we ended up leaving a conversation agreeing that even for them, they couldn't believe that the schools were funded based on the percentage of the taxes paid in that district. And they thought it was unfair because they also knew the white poor people were also impacted by that same system. So if I could come out of a conversation agreeing with them on something, then guess what? I bet you there are more people we agree with, but we make assumptions about them based on their political party, based on where they live, based on what church they go to, what synagogue, what mosque they go to, that we wouldn't even be willing to engage in a conversation. And then what do we end up doing? Preaching to the choir. And I'm not, I, I, I can't afford to preach to the choir anymore. I just can't, my people can't afford it. We're not enough. I need my, this choir that we're in got to be multiplied or we are never going to get freedom and liberation for our people. For the sake of time, there's some feedback that I'll share with you. Mm -hmm. If you did not get to uh, your question asked, please connect during the, the book signing and I'll also get to the YouTube que questions then. But these two I think are very important. Given the opportunity um, of free radio announcements, what community events would you send? And then the other thing is how do we motivate people to show up when so many are staying home due to COVID? This is a hard question right. for me. Um, because, and I, first I'll say this with this caveat. There are people in our community that are immunocompromised. And those people deserve to be protected and safe. And those people should have the ability to not, you know, to be able not to come out to and show up because they need to protect themselves and we need them healthy in our communities. But there are so many ways that you could engage in precautions and still show up for other people. I just can't, I'm not in a place where I'm going to allow COVID to stop me from standing up for justice and standing up for the most marginalized people. Cops don't care about COVID, they still killing the people. COVID doesn't care about still banning immigrants at the border or terrorizing asylees who are coming to these United States of America. COVID doesn't care about the continued military occupation funded by the American people and the American government. So I, I reject this idea that because of COVID, we're going to stay home or we're, or we're not going to go outside. Some of us have to do that. And those that have to do that, please do that because you are worthy and we deserve you to be healthy. But some of you can wear a mask. Some of you could stand a little farther away for some people. But your presence is still important outside. And this COVID business isn't going away. Every day there's some new thing that came out. And so when I say to folks that, Yes, we protect ourselves, we use precaution, we take the COVID test. If you have COVID, don't come to the events, don't go to the protest. But if you are and you don't have COVID, wear that mask and get yourself outside. Because again, injustice doesn't, like it's not like COVID came and injustice stopped. So then what do you do? The injustice is continuous. So I just can't allow for this pandemic to put us in a place where we are just sitting at home, just hoping that we individual. In fact, I know that this is going to be really controversial. 
and this statement is not for people who are immunocompromised or have people they live with who are immunocompromised, who they are responsible for. And I want those people to know that I love them and I know that if they could, they would be. But for everybody else, it's a little selfish. If you could wear a mask and you could take a COVID test and you are negative and you could wear a mask and come outside and be outside and you decide to not do that when a family needs you, when a community needs you, um, it just, it's just something that I, that I personally can't make that decision for myself. So just use your best judgment and know that there are people that are counting on you. And if you can't do that, we love you anyway because we know if, that, if you could, you would be there. Why don't you put your hands together? Better than that, Seattle. Come on and put your hands together. Uh, we're, uh, we're going to, let's just, we want to thank, uh, we do this work in community. We want to thank the Innovation and Vitality Office for the United Methodist Church. Christina's here. Uh, David, uh, Rabbi David from Kadima, Sam from Mossad. Uh, anybody from the Council of Churches here, or uh, uh, CARE is here, um, uh, who, are, who else am I forgetting? We got a bunch of them. Uh, 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 MAPS, uh, as well as we have uh, the United Church of Christ, uh, uh, the UCCs are uh, streaming this live on their uh, website as well. Uh, and we are looking forward to uh, being in continued contact with you. We uh, have an action coming up April, a April 8th at the uh, Tacoma uh, uh, Northwest Detention Center. Uh, Dr. Spaulding is going to be reaching out to you, so sign up on email. There's a code you can scan on the program that you can get more information about us. If you want to make a little offering, we appreciate that. I won't raise one and lock the doors like my grandfather did. <laughs> and is, there, is there anything else, Dr. Spaulding? I just want to say you feel energized. Yeah. You, feel, you feel like you got some tools that you needed. Yeah. Can we give another round of applause and thank Linda Sassor for being here? Can we also give a round of applause to our musicians for such a phenomenal job? And we also have an action coming up this week. If uh, Rabbi David could come forward, he's going to share a little bit more with us about that. Well, it's bright up here. Um, hi. Hi? Hi. There we go. Okay. Um, action. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, and I just want to say Rafu Ashlema, which is um, a prayer for uh, the quickest prayer for healing and recovery for all of us here. Uh, for Sister Linda, who's, who's flying cross country, uh, may you be well and safe in your journey. Um, may your kids uh, welcome you home uh, with celebration. Um, right now, uh, many of us might be under the impression, or there is, we, People are trying to put the impression on us that it's not possible to stand up against anti-Semitism and completely stand up for Palestinian human rights. It is possible. We are doing it. And right now, King County Council is considering a proclamation that would silence speech for Palestinian human rights, go against free speech, and harm many Jews who speak out for Palestinian human rights. And there is an alternative proclamation that we have a QR code in the back and are asking for your support in telling King County Council, who is going to use this week being International Holocaust Remembrance Day, this coming Friday, to come up and say we are against anti-Semitism and put forth a definition that silences free speech and the speech for Palestinian human rights. Please um, join us in supporting a proclamation that can denounce anti-Semitism, but that also stands true for free speech. Um, QR code is in the back, and I'm going to uh, please scan it on your way out. 
Sorry, this is all like hot off presses and I'm like getting texts as we speak about it. <laughs> there has been a lot going on the last week. Um, Sister Anila from MAPS, amen, is in the back with a QR code. I'll have one on me as well. Um, your action and not just you signing, but your sharing of this. Um, there is a very concerted effort um, trying to, to make this pass uh, to, to push down this free, this free speech. Um, and we, we can't let that stand as um, in, in, in the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King County. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you all. You. Thank you. So uh, we, we're going to get ready and dis, uh, uh, um, dismiss. Uh, I, I'm so cold. To <laughs> we're going to uh, get ready to get out of here. Uh, uh, Linda is going to be signing books uh, in the back. Uh, her newest book, uh, We're this, In This Together, is a book for young adults. Uh, we have about uh, eight of those back there, and you can grab those on your way out. We have other books out there from, uh, this is part of a series uh, called Set Us Free From Fear. Uh, earlier this, uh, in November, we had Dr. Aubrey Hendricks and Dr. Uh, Athena Butler talking about white supremacy in the midterm elections. Uh, Linda has come and spoken. Uh, Highlander Center, you'll be getting information, is going to do an online training on how to combat uh, white supremacy. And then on all, uh, April 2nd at 11 a.m., Dr. Cornell West will be here with us um, uh, as the final uh, part of our Set Us Free From uh, Fear series, which comes from our prayer when we ask that God to set us free from fear and hostility and that we might be open-hearted and open-handed. Why don't you sing us out? Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Something for us, Casey. for me, Jason.
Let it shine. Let it shine.